So I think this uh, meeting has been really exciting and interesting thus far, and I want to thank my, uh, the organizers for inviting me and my colleagues for their excellent presentations. And today I'm going to speak about substance use. Um, as you know, the transition to young adulthood is marked by many changes, and during this transition we see large increases in substance use for many reasons, including movement away from parents, initiation of new and varied friendships, new roles, uh, more choices and opportunities, greater independence. Um, identity exploration and self-focus. So in other words, it's a period where there's a lot more freedom and a lot less social control, and all of these issues increase the risk for substance use. It's also a period of heightened instability, and a lot of kids turn to alcohol and drugs to deal with the stresses of this instability. And I just want to show you some data. This is from the National uh, Survey, um, the National Survey of Drug Use on Health. Drug use and health. Anyway, um, what you see here is that um, this is binge drinking in the past month, which is defined as drinking five or more drinks on one occasion. And what you see here is that it peaks during young adulthood with a gradual decline over time, with the highest peak around between 21 and 25 years old. You see the same thing for illicit drug use, and this is primarily um, marijuana use, but you also see this large peak in young adulthood, peaking a little bit younger than binge drinking at between 18 and 20 years old. Now we know that heavy drinking and uh, drug use by ad adolescents and young adults uh, creates a lot of problems, including brain impairment, academic and job failure, physical and sexual assaults, crimes and violence, unintended pregnancies, and all of these factors have long-term effects on physical and psychological well-being. Just to give you some examples, these are data from Ralph Hinkson and his colleagues. They estimated in 2005 that 5,500 youth between the ages of 18 and 24 died from an alcohol-related unintentional injury, including a motor vehicle accident, and more than 7 million drove under the influence of alcohol. They also estimate that about 599,000 college students each year are unintentionally injured under the influence of alcohol, that about 696 college students, 600 college students are assaulted by another student who had been drinking, 97,000 students are victims of sexual assault or rape, and about 474 100,000 students have unprotected sex due to alcohol use. So you see that substance use is tied very closely to the two topics that Ted and Jim were just discussing. But not all youth are equally likely to begin using drugs or get involved in uh, heavy drinking. Uh, there are sociodemographic correlates. For example, young adults who are married are less likely to drink heavily and use drugs than their peers who are dating or single. Um, those who live at home with their parents, especially college students, are protected from heavy drinking, but not necessarily drug use. So there's another positive effect of moving back with parents. Um, in terms of employment, uh, it depends on the nature of the job. Those who are working full-time in a satisfying job are uh, less likely uh, to drink heavily and use drugs than those who are unemployed or those working full-time in a menial job. Um, I'm going to show you sex and race ethnicity differences and I'll get to college status in a few minutes. In terms of sex, you have uh, males in yellow and females in turquoise and you see in terms of drinking, these are data from the Monitoring the Future study, uh, prevalence of drinking is fairly similar for males and females, but males tend to drink more often and in greater quantities. <coughs> males also tend to use illicit drugs more often during young adulthood. In terms of uh, race, ethnicity, we have whites in yellow, blacks in turquoise, Hispanics in red, and what we basically see is in young adulthood, whites are more likely to drink and drink in greater quantities than blacks or Hispanics, and also whites are more likely to use 
uh, drugs. And we see these same patterns in adolescents. However, if you take these a little bit older, when you go from 26 and beyond, blacks are more likely to report illicit drug use than whites. Besides sociodemographic differences, there are psychosocial characteristics that place individuals at risk for substance use. For example, youth who, youth who are more impulsive and high risk takers are more likely to be involved in drug use and heavy drinking than their peers who don't have these characteristics. Similarly, those who are depressed and anxious are more likely to be involved in drug use. Uh, we know that peer substance use is the best predictor of, an, of a young adult's substance use, but parents still continue to have an effect even during young adulthood. And these same risk factors, especially <coughs> impulsivity and sensation seeking, are related to violence and uh, unsafe sexual behavior, sort of part of the common causes that Jim was just referring to. Now I'd like to get on to college status differences. I think it's really important that we begin to look more at this because virtually every intervention for substance use is done with college students. So we are ignoring the forgotten half of youth who do not go to college. And so I want to show you some slides from a study that I did. Uh, it's a longitudinal study of adolescents from New Jersey who were followed from early adolescence into uh, adulthood. And in this particular analysis, we were interested in comparing those who went to college to those who did not in terms of their substance use and related problems. Now, at age 18, we had a substantial proportion who were still in high school, and then the rest had made the transition out of high school. And we were curious as to whether there would be differences in substance use before and after that transition out of high school. And what you see here are the significant main, of, oh, sorry, significant main effects for high school status. Those who at age 18 were still in high school reported lower rates of cigarette quantity frequency, times high on alcohol, and marijuana quantity frequency than their peers had or, who had already made this transition, and it was regardless of college status. But more importantly, we were interested in changes over time. So here, you see you have the non-college females in red, the uh, college females in blue, the non-college males in green, and keep an eye on this green group for the next few slides, and the college males in yellow. And this was differences in changes in cigarette quantity frequency at ages 18, 21, and 30. And what we see here is a significant main effect of college status. Non-college males and females report significantly higher rates at all three ages than college males and females. And this is the only variable that we didn't have a gender effect. Here you see the same data for times high on alcohol. And what you see here is a significant gender effect with males reporting much higher rates than females, but absolutely no significant difference in college status uh, drinking levels, even during the college years at age 21. For marijuana use, we see, here's where the green line starts showing up. These are the non-college males, and they report significantly higher rates of marijuana quantity and frequency at all age periods and show much less likelihood of maturing out of their marijuana use by adulthood. Um, and finally, these are marijuana-related problems among users. And again, we see that this green line, the non-college males, report the highest levels at ages 18 and 30 than the other three groups, and higher levels than the women at age 21, and again, are much less likely to mature out. We found the exact same thing for alcohol problems. So basically, what we found in this study was the transition out of high school was important for increases in substance use regardless of college status, that cigarette use was consistently higher among non-students than college students, that marijuana use was consistently higher among non-student males, um, that alcohol use was not related to college status at any of the age periods, and that alcohol and marijuana problems were consistently highest among non-student males. However, 
my research was probably from pre predominantly with white middle and working class samples. And Shensel and Burkholder argue that low income and minority youth are an even more important target for uh, um, prevention for substance abuse. Not only do they have the same risk factors that come with that transition from adolescence to young adulthood as their white middle class and upper class counterparts, but they also experience many other risk factors, including uh, lack of job opportunities, uh, lack of good role models, discrimination, and the like. So they argue that these youth are at even higher risk of increased substance use in young adulthood. So it's obvious that we need to develop interventions for all youth. We know that most are going to mature out of their substance use by the time they get to uh, adulthood, but we have to reduce the risk during their peak using years. We also know that some of this group is going to go on to develop problems and alcohol and drug disorders. So we have to come up with interventions to prevent the development of those disorders. Obviously, college heavy drinkers are an important target group for these interventions. But non-college youth are an equally or more important target group for alcohol use and a much more important target group for cigarette and illicit drug use prevention programs. Now, one type of intervention that we've been having pretty much success with with college students is these personal feedback interventions, sort of what Jim was getting at, where you individualize the information to the youth. The idea between, behind a personal feedback intervention is that if you heighten the student's awareness of their personal patterns of use in relation to their peers, and you point out to them the risks and problems that they have related to their use, this heightened awareness will motivate them to change their behavior. We know that students overestimate the amount that other students use, so if you provide them with the actual levels of use by the other students, they may reduce their use in accordance with the real rates. And these types of interventions have been proven very effective on college campuses um, especially when delivered in the context of a brief motivational in interview. And this is with heavy drinking volunteers and with mandated students. But some studies have found that even mailing these feedback profiles or giving them by computer is enough to reduce student heavy drinking. And recently, some people have begun to adopt these interventions for use with marijuana on college campuses and have been showing some promising re results, at least in the short term, although the uh, l research is really limited at this point. But the point is, they do work on the short term, but we do see that these effects do dissipate over time, and we may need to uh, develop booster sessions for them. What, what happens with the personal feedback is the student is given their drinking uh, compared to the college averages, their negative consequences of use, their expectancies, their risk factors for later use, such as having a family history of alcoholism or having high levels of depression, uh, their blood alcohol concentrations and what those levels mean. Sometimes they're given protective strategies to help reduce risk, and even some salient messages about the amount of money they spend on uh, alcohol or the number of calories they gain from drinking. Uh, here you see a sample personal feedback profile. I can't really get into it now because I'm on the yellow, but uh, basically, based on what you said you drank in the last month, you were getting about 80,000 calories. It would take you about 1,600 hours of brisk walking or 914 uh, hours, minutes of, I mean, minutes of jogging to get rid of these calories. <laughs> And that message really works with college females. <laughs> so anyway, basically, uh, it's obvious that we do need to move ahead and begin to develop and, more importantly, test new interventions for drug use and for non-college students. Obviously, accessing or recruiting non-college students is a major issue right now. How do we recruit them? When and where do we intervene? Perhaps this new social media stuff we heard about this morning might be the way to go. Uh, but it's clear that if we can begin to move some of these interventions 
outside of the college campus will be able to reduce the problems associated with substance use for all young adults. Thank you.